Hello friends, thank you for joining us again tonight for another exciting Bible study, God's Word Alive. This is going to be a really, really, really good Bible study. And uh, we're going we're gonna to cover some things tonight, maybe you've never heard before, but we're just praying that everybody recognizes Jesus' voice. This is for Jesus tonight. Amen. Etienne, will you uh, get us uh, any housekeeping that we got to Yes, sure. we're so glad that you're with us again this evening, and um, we want you to be participating along with us, especially when it comes to the time where we will offer some prayers up on behalf of the request that you sent in. So toward the end of the, uh, the time together this evening, we want you to start sending in prayer requests. The number to text them to is 479-220-7107. Also, as we go along, if there's a scripture that pops in your head that you want to share with us that goes along with what we're talking about, we'd love to hear from you. Sure. Yeah. There's one other thing I'd like to add. Uh, I learned something last week that I believe could be helpful to some of our audience. Uh, I am not an electronic buff. Uh, my wife has to end up doing most of the, the pointing out of everything at home. But if you pull down from the top of your uh, smartphone and you get the option to say screen mirroring, most of us are taking the Facebook feed and we're throwing it up on our TV through screen mirroring. Well, I have learned that that is my problem. I'm having to turn the television volume up almost full blast to hear it when I do screen mirroring. Whereas if I will go on my TV and go to internet and pull up Facebook and use uh, mine or my wife's uh, Facebook login, we can go to the feed there and, oh my goodness, the volume is so nice. I could hear you guys, all, all three of you so perfectly wow. when, I, when I put it on TV correctly. So lesson tonight is don't do screen mirroring. Pull it up on your internet, on your TV. Okay, thank you, Tim. How about a prayer? Okay, we better do that. <laughs> Heavenly Father, as we get going tonight, we, we want to once again ask for amazing power from the Holy Spirit. Lord, enlighten our hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. We'd like uh, your words to come through in such a way that the folks that are tuning in are gaining a huge blessing from studying your word tonight. Lord, please add that blessing to the reading of your word. We're lifting up Jesus tonight. Jesus is our message. He is our only hope. And Lord, it is in you that we put our hope tonight. Hope for a better world. Hope for the second coming. Hope for healing in all of our families all across this land. Jesus, you're the only one, so we're, we're worshiping you tonight, and we ask you to be with us in this study. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay, guys, we've had a really good Bible study. Uh, we're talking about um, that uh, every, every time Jesus, every time God is, is, is uh, about to do something big, he always sends a messenger out to warn he, he's done that. We, we, I, we're, I'm sharing things we already shared before, but Noah, you know, at the time of the flood, he had Noah. Uh, you know, Jesus' first coming, he had John the Baptist. That's right. Uh, and, and now, I think everybody would agree that something is going on. I mean, something is. I think everybody knows that something's about to happen, and uh, something is about to happen really big. Jesus Christ is coming, and Amen. he's coming soon. And, but before he comes, wouldn't he give a, a message the same way? And yes, the answer is yes, he does give a message. It's right found in the very last book of the Bible, right in the very heart of this last book, and called the three angel message. It's found in Revelation 14. Now, to get into this, to dig into this, I think we need to set some context. Uh, for instance, back up a few chapters, Revelation chapter 12, for example. Revelation chapter 12 gives us a clue, a picture uh, that this helps explain why God's giving this message here now. In Revelation chapter 12, we, we, it starts out, uh, there appeared a great wonder in heaven and a woman clothed with sun, the sun and the moon under her feet and under her head a crown of 12 stars. This beautiful woman, this pure woman, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And then, and then the scene changes uh, it's to, to, uh, in, in, in heaven and we see something crazy happen in heaven. 
War. 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 Of right. all things, war in heaven. Of all places, there was war. Um, and we know that the Bible paints a picture that Satan and his angels, Satan, who, who's, who, who works by deception, is deceiving the angels, and we know that he wants worship. Now, we learned that in Isaiah. We covered this all last week. In, in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14, we covered that. And it, gets, it paints a picture that he wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted the worship that really only belonged to God. But we know that war broke out, and what happened to Satan? He lost. He lost. And him and his angels were... Were kicked out. They were it's, kicked out. It's interesting when you read that passage a little further down in Revelation 12. It said, Rejoice ye, O heavens, but woe to the woe. earth. That's yeah. right. You know, yeah. Because Satan has come down, and he is madder than a hornet. He got kicked out of heaven. Yeah. And now he's going after us. Yeah. And I think Revelation twelve seventeen yeah. says, and the dragon, that's the devil, that's right. uh, was wroth with the woman. Now the woman, a woman represents what, guys? Church. The church. church. God's people. And so the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep, which do what? The commandments of God. The commandments of God and the testimony, the testimony of Jesus, Jesus. Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, both very important. So that's that's Revelation 12. And then we get into Revelation 13 and we see just sure enough, uh, uh, true to uh, God's warning, what does Satan do, do? What does he do? He goes straight into the religious business. He, right. he, he deceives people because that's, that's, that's his that's his weapon of choice is deception. We're no match for his deceiving power. He deceives people into thinking they're worshiping God, but they're really worshiping him. His counterfeit. Can I just say that? Yeah. His counterfeit uh, uh, form of worship here. You know, that, I read something very interesting the other day. Um, I forgot who, who made the comment. It was an author of, of a book that's commenting on this whole process that's going on, on, up in heaven. And the comment was made, and I forgot what scriptures they used to back up the statement, but the statement was made that when Jesus came down here as a, in human form, he was warned never to engage in, in um, uh, conversation or debating with the devil. Hmm. Even Jesus himself in human form was warned never to debate with a Satan. And that's why you see in Matthew 4, he says, get behind me. It's I'm written. That's you. all he says. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't yeah. argue with them. Nothing. Yeah. He just gives them one answer from God's word. Thus saith the Lord. That's how good that's he is right. with deception. That's right. If Jesus had tried to debate him on issues, he could have gotten Jesus to fall. Yeah. We're, none of us are so no we have match. No, we have no match. We're no match No for match for no Satan's match for deceiving yeah. power. So that's Revelation 13. Mm -hmm. And then we get into Revelation 14, which is where we're, we've been at. And, the, and as soon as we get into Revelation 14, it's, it's, like, it's like God says, okay, he starts send, he's, he's sending his messengers out you know, to come back to true worship, to the truth. Where, yeah. where is the truth at? In God's in, Word. In, in God's word, word. word. In the Word of God. And, and it paints a picture of these people uh, that, that, have, that have overcome the deceiving power of the enemy by relying completely on the Word of God. And it says, and, and I have a question, it says these people, Revelation 14 and verse 4, that these people here, uh, that they that there are people that will follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes. Is that, what is, what is does that, that mean? Is that something new that they do when they get up there? Uh, no. Yeah. They did it down here. Oh yeah! In order to follow the Lamb up there, they got to follow Him down here. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes. what does it mean to follow the Lamb? Wheresoever He goes, what does that mean to us? Well, I think in in practical terms, it it starts off with living like Jesus lived. Yeah. So the very first part of Jesus' day, He was always found in prayer. That's right. He was always found communicating with his heavenly father. He has laid down the example for us to follow him the way he went. Amen. I think this is where we start. Yes. This is the most important thing and it is it is everything. Paramount. It is paramount, that's right. Yeah. If we don't start here, we're not gonna have any yeah. match, yeah. Uh, be any match for Satan. Yeah, yeah if, you, if you think about it, you know, you get, John was the disciple <clears throat> that Jesus loved and he's called the beloved disciple. 
in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, he says, anyone that claims to be a Christian should walk as Jesus walked. That's right. So if we, if we claim to be his followers, mm -hmm. then we should act like he did. That's right. So if you, if, you, if you turn it around and put it in different words, God's ideal for each one of us is one and the same. Mm -hmm. And that's to reflect Jesus, that's right. to be just like Jesus yeah. was. To be a sweet fragrance of Jesus, that's right. to be a walking epistle that's right. of Jesus. That's right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, guys. You know, if we get this right, if we get this right here, we don't have to worry about any warnings. If we get this right, if we follow the Lamb, if we keep our eyes on the Lamb, uh, Tim, I like what you brought up. He he gave us examples, step by step examples, of how to live that life. Well, Luke chapter uh, eleven in verse one, the disciples they come up on Jesus one day, and and uh, and they they found him doing something apparently that he that they had caught him doing many times, because he was at a certain place, and and so they walk up to him and they and they say, Lord. Teach us to do what? Pray. pray. To pray. I mean, they could have asked him to teach him to do anything. They could have said, teach us to work miracles. Teach us to walk on water. You know, but that's not what they said. They said, teach us to pray. They realized there was something about Jesus' prayer life. There was something about his connection with his Father in heaven that they knew that's where he got his power from. Mm -hmm. They knew that that's where he got his direction from. Friends, that's what it means to follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes. Then, Another interesting point about that group of people that stand victorious, because if you read Revelation chapter 13, it's a very bleak picture. It doesn't look like anybody escapes Satan's deception. Yeah, and the then world. all of a sudden... John sees the, the picture change, and yeah. all of a sudden he sees there are some victorious ones yeah. that stand on Mount Zion with a lamb. In verse 1, I think it's verse 1, where it, it, it gives us several identifying marks of who these people are. Uh -huh. And one of them that, that caught my attention was, it says that it had the name of the Father written in their foreheads. Yeah. So I thought, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So I went and I looked. And last week we talked about what it means to give glory to God. And those same verses give us the answer to this too. Yeah. Because if you look at Exodus, and I'm not going to read all of them because we want to get to where we want to go today. Mm -hmm. But Exodus 33, verse 18 and 19, and then Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. That's where Moses was on the mountain. And when you look at those verses, you will see in verse 18 or verse 19, uh, God tells Moses, I will let my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. Then you go to verse 34, chapter 34 and verse 6 and 7, and when God goes by them and proclaims his name, he gives all his character traits. Mm -hmm. So those who stand with the Lamb on Mount Zion have been transformed. They've gone through the metamorphosis of thinking and acting like Jesus did. Mm hmm that's why they get to stand with a yeah. lamb on Mount Zion at the end. So as we go through tonight's study, we will see how important this whole thing about the atonement and the judgment is because mm -hmm. God is not only going through the records in, in heaven, but he's trying to get sin out of our lives yeah. to, for us to be like Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so, so follow, these follow the lamb wheresoever he goes. Then we get into the first angel message, Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. I'm just going to read this to kind of get us going here. Then I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having an everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, uh, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. Now, Tim... We have, we have taken this apart, we've dissected it, we've chewed on it, we've shared it, and I know that you're excited. There's something more that, you, that you probably you had picked out of this first angel message that you want to share with us, and we want to give you a chance. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you already the, shared it. The, the yeah. snow has kept them away for two weeks, yeah, and there now, you go. now you got the floor. Well, I, I can't help but want to keep making this simple resummarizing make this make this easy for repetition for, is good yeah for good everybody for to 
to pull this all together because you're, you're talking about um, following the lamb wherever he goes. Yes. And he's wanting us to give a special message, yeah. calling everybody back to creator worship. And, and I would want the, the, all of us to realize while we're studying this whole section from Revelation 12 through 14, there's that unholy trinity sitting over there called the dragon and the sea beast and the land beast. That's the unholy trinity. We're, we're, we're trying to warn about these guys. Yeah. And, and, and these guys have a special, uh, a, a, a special religion themselves. Mm -hmm. It's quite religious. It's quite right. religious. Yeah. And we're, we're coming up here on a, Three Angels, and we're supposed to share truth. Well, what is truth? And what is truth compared to what the unholy trinity is, is putting out Better. for the whole world mm -hmm. to take in? And I would want to dig a little bit further tonight and just say, if we're going to follow the lamb wherever he goes, we need to recognize right off the bat that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, yeah. and the life. That's right. Jesus was the embodiment of truth. Yes, lived out. It was truth lived out. This is what he's calling us back to today with worship true worship true worship this is not just head knowledge yeah. that i can go up and defeat the unholy trinity so that i can have a bunch of proof text and say oh you guys are wrong about this and you guys are wrong about that and you guys are wrong about that i have truth it's bigger than this far bigger this is truth coming on the inside amen it's experiencing the gospel i'll, I'll write the laws in our heart it's, it's a new covenant amen. Write the law in our, amen. New heart, in our hearts right. amen yes. this if if jesus if we're to follow jesus wherever he goes we are to follow him into a life of sanctification amen time is short we've got to learn how to let him sanctify our lives we've got to learn how to let him into our hearts this is the truth that's got to come out mm -hmm. while we go through these yeah. through these messages. Okay, you let me have one section yeah. there. Uh, I'll try good. to jump back in okay. on another. One. Wow, you, you got me thinking though because I know <laughs> before I started studying the Bible, I really thought that uh, that the, the devil was was going to be like in the, on this red fork, you know, yeah, red the, outfit, the, 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 and, the, 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 and uh, here I am, the devil, you know, or this scary beast, you know. But do you think the devil is that dumb? No, he's deceiving, right? No. He's going to come in, and, and the Bible's painted very clear. He's even he's even gotten infiltrated the it, you know the religious business. He's 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 oh. he's got a counterfeit worship. People think they're worshiping God. We have got to be so careful, friends. We got to get in the Word of God. We've got to spend time with Jesus. Said, Lord, I want you to lead me to all truth. I I want you to search my heart, and that's the that's that's true worship. Uh, so I want to bring up one thing here uh, in this uh, first angel before we, we're going to go in the second angel. Believe it or not, we're going to go in the second angel tonight. <laughs> but this is so important. We want to lay a really good foundation here because we're not wrestling yeah. with flesh and blood here, but against powers and principalities. So we want we want to break things down into bite sized pieces because every even the wording here is so important here. We've talked about fear of God. We talked about how to bring glory to God. Uh, Etienne brought up uh, the, the way we can bring glory to God is through the character, Sorry. you know, reflecting the character of God, actually internalizing. That's kind of what Tim was talking about. This is it's not just enough to have a head knowledge, but you've got to apply this to your life. He, you've got to allow Jesus Christ to, to, to write this on your heart. And so it will be changing yeah. here. Um, the next one, one comment, one word here that I want to bring up here, it says... Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. Now, there's a lot of people out there that when they hear the word judgment, they just freeze up. They think, oh no. And they get scared and they get full of fear and everything. But I, I, we brought this up one other night, I, I think it was a couple weeks ago. Notice the wording here. It says for the hour of His judgment. That's, that's point number one I want to make here. His judgment. You know, it's not only us on trial, but God's on trial here. 
yeah, to prove if, that he's fair and just. Yeah, yeah, if you think about it, any judge that presides over a case is judged upon how he handled the case, whether he was fair or not. That's right. So indirectly, God sits on trial, even though Daniel tells us the books were opened, and you read um, Ecclesiastes 12, and Solomon tells you what's coming up in the judgment. It's our good and our bad deeds. So that comes yeah. up too. But ultimately, the way God presides over this will determine whether the world, the universe sees him as fair or not. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really a lot about God being vindicated from the devil's accusations that, 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 uh, that he's not a fair That's and right. just God That's right. That's and everything. Right. But we know at Calvary, at Calvary, we see God was both fair and just because, because Jesus Christ, he paid the price. God paid the price for us. And, and he's just because he can justify us uh, through the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. So if, we, if we've got Jesus, we don't have to be scared. We don't have to be scared, right? Uh, in, in fact, if, you, if someone would read, uh, for, Tim, if you'd go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, and, and then uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 after that, and then Etienne, if you go to, to uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 through 13, let's, if we got Jesus, if we follow the Lamb, friends, we've got nothing to worry about. So, Tim, would you go first? <clears throat> if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. And then uh, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1, My little children... These things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's everything. He's the judge. He's, a, he's our lawyer. He, he's our sacrifice. He's our, he's our uh, propitiation. He, he's our everything. Jesus did it all, friends. And share yours, okay. uh, 1 John 5, 11 through 13. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. The one who has the Son has life. The one who doesn't have the Son of God does not have life. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So, so we can have confidence that we have eternal life. We don't have to fear the judgment. We don't have to fear the judgment. If we've got Jesus... If we follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes, if we cling to Jesus, we can have confidence. And I want to read one more scripture. This is found in Romans chapter 5 in verse 8 through 10. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through, 8 through 10. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died, died for us. us. Yeah. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved What's, and I, I, y'all probably not there, from the wrath, of, from, from wrath through him. We'll be saved from the wrath from, uh, uh, through him, through Jesus. So who takes the wrath of God? Jesus. We all Jesus, Jesus. Yes. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus does. Jesus does. And so this is so important. And I just, I just want to make that, uh, just, just drive that stake down. Don't forget about that. You cling to Jesus and you're going to be okay. You run to Jesus and you're going to be okay. There's another thing. Any, guys, any more comments about oh, this? Before? Yeah, just a couple yeah. more scriptures uh, driving home the same point. Yeah. I love how Isaiah says it in Isaiah 114. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Amen. Ooh, that's a big promise. Yes, I am it so is. thankful for that. They shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. And I can't help but think of uh, Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. And uh, there's something, there's some kind of a miracle that we're trying to talk about tonight. And it's a little bit further down in that Romans 8 chapter. It's in... Uh, uh, verse 4, it says that he condemns sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. He's That's got what you were saying heart about. work that he can do in us that the righteous requirement of the law can be in our hearts. That's right. That's yes. his ultimate goal. That yes. is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. 
So, so there's the three angels' yeah, messages. No, what, yeah. One thing that I noticed that I noticed, and Paul <laughs> got this. Most of his epistles, he starts off Paul, a bond servant mm -hmm. of Christ Jesus. That yeah. means he might as well say Paul, a slave of Jesus. Yes. Paul figured out quickly that in order for him to live a righteous life, Jesus had to be in him to do the righteous deed. That's right. In other words, Paul had absolutely no mind of his own. No. Mm -hmm. Christ's mind had to be in him. That's right. In order for him to live the life that Christ wanted him to live. But that's where the devil has us by the tail sometimes. We mm -hmm. think we can dictate the relationship we have with Jesus. It doesn't work that way. We are his slave. Yeah. <laughs> See? We, that, and that's the problem where Satan can trip us up. Because I can say all I want to that I have a relationship with, King, with, with Prince Charles. But I don't have one. Because I don't know him and he doesn't know me. But mm -hmm. I can say I have one. Yeah. And I can say it enough that I can believe it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I have one. Yeah. So that's where the whole thing comes in. We, we look at the picture of the gospel. The gospel says, Paul says, we are baptized with Christ into the watery grave. Mm -hmm. Nobody that's alive gets buried. We have to be, be dead. Kicking and screaming. We have to be dead. <laughs> or, of course, like showing up in an accident scene and they've got the white sheet over the people that, that died in the accident. All of a sudden, the white sheet starts moving. Yeah. That's no good. There can't be life <laughs> yeah. under that white sheet, yeah, you know? Yeah. So if we want to be covered by Christ's righteousness, we have to be dead to self. Right? That's what the Bible says. We've got to cling to Jesus. We, and, and, and the only way he can do anything in us is when we're dead. Yeah. Because otherwise, surrendered. Yeah. Otherwise, the old man that Paul talks about yes. wants to come to the surface. Coming yeah. Keeps coming so, up. friends, yeah. it's all about Jesus. That's yes. that's the point we're trying to make here. Uh, that that uh, very er early on in in my Christian walk, I, I learned uh, from the guys that was teaching me uh, that it's all about Jesus, and I've learned not to depend on myself for anything. You got. I can't trust myself Amen. either. I've got to totally rely on Jesus, the Word of God. Follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes. Now, there's another thing that I want to bring up about this judgment here. And, and uh, I don't want time to get away, but that's okay. We're not going to rush this. We're not going to rush it uh, because we want to lay this foundation here. Another very important part about the judgment here. Uh, it, it says that we, uh, for the hour of His judgment has come. Uh, so the three angel message is sharing a message that we are living in the time of judgment. And so to understand this, what really what we're talking about here is we need to go back to the Old Testament, uh, during the Old Testament uh, sanctuary, the tabernacle that was built uh, at the very beginning that God had Moses make. And we'll go to the scripture there and look at that uh, it, here in just a minute. But it was never, and this is so important, it was never God's plan that sin would last forever. That sin would just keep on just cycling. You know, people born, they sin, they die. And that was never God's plan that this would just continue on forever and ever and ever. It's, it's in God's plan, and it always has been part of God's plan, that there would be a day in the future that He appointed that, that He would put away sin forever. That He would put away sin forever. Uh, that's that's so, something interesting about the judgment that I saw. You know, very. Uh, I I was reading some commentaries, and many of the reformers, even the reformers, and you know the the predominant teaching throughout the 17 and 18 and early 1900s within the church was that there was only one judgment, and that was when Jesus separated the sheep and the goats at His coming. That's why William Miller, when he saw the 2300 evenings and mornings. With the Millerite movement, that's why he believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the cleansing of the earth because they believed there was only one phase of the judgment and that happened at Jesus' second coming. So when you look at the passage here, you'll see several things. It's in the present tense. Okay, So this judgment occurs at the same time that the messages are being proclaimed. Same time. The purpose of the messages when you go down to Revelation 14, verse 14 through 20, is the ripening of the harvests, both the grapes and the wheat. So we know when we sow seed, 
those things don't grow forever, am I right? At some point you have to harvest or they'll die. So this message that goes out will do one of two things to the hearts of people. It'll either soften it mm -hmm. to surrender to Jesus or it'll harden it. Mm -hmm. And that's what ripens the harvest, this message. The judgment com is completed when the message has had its full effect on the hearts of men, either to soften and surrender or harden and to fall into the harvest of the grapes. So that's where I okay. see these messages and a judgment come into play is God is giving the world a last chance and he's saying, I'm, I'm sending you this message of this wonderful love that I have for you. I want it to have an effect on your heart. Yep. But if, if this won't get your heart, then there's nothing more I can do for yeah. you. It's if you yeah. what, he gives everybody an opportunity to see a true revelation of That's himself. Right. That's right. And if they don't repent and turn away, then exactly. what else can he do? Exactly. What else can he exactly. do? Uh, he he shared with us in the Old Testament uh, that uh, a very clear picture that uh, how he deals with the sin problem. Uh, when you look at the in the Old Testament sanctuary or the, called the tabernacle, and then later on was a temple. Uh, it was a symbolic picture of how God was going to deal with sin. And it was never God's plan that it was going to last forever. And so he gives us a picture daily uh, uh, through, through this. And in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 and 9. Let me read that here, if I could. Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary. Why? That I may dwell among them. See, sin separates us from God. Uh, God created us for a relationship. He created us uh, for a daily relationship. But sin has come into our life and we're separated from God. So he, he says, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishing, just so you shall make it. So he's letting us know here that this, that this sanctuary, and it's very important to know this, that the sanctuary... The earthly sanctuary is just a replica of the true sanctuary that's in heaven. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 8, and I'm just going to fly through these pretty quick here for sake of time. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1, it says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. So, let me go through this. Uh, we've shared this back when we were studying Daniel here uh, several months ago, but I'm just going to kind of fly through this pretty quick here, how, the, how the, daily, the daily sanctuary would work or the daily tabernacle. Let's just say that I would sin. I would bring my, my lamb uh, up to, to the tabernacle, and I would place my hand upon the lamb, and I would cut the lamb's throat, and the blood would come out of this innocent lamb, and they would catch some of this blood. And as I, as I confess my sin uh, over this lamb, symbolically, uh, my sin was transferred to the blood of this lamb, which was carried into the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle uh, was broken into compartments. And it was, you got the holy place and the most holy place. And so every day, as, as people would sin, this, this would take place. Over and over, this would take place. It's called the daily sacrifices in the, the that were made and and the sin symbolically what was happened is the happening is the sins of all the people were carried into the sanctuary now god was teaching us here this is the very same thing that 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 uh we can do now through first john 1 9 that mm -hmm. tim read earlier mm -hmm. if we uh we confess our sins and, and and as we confess our sins our our sins are uh jesus is the lamb and our sins are, are, are forgiven yeah. at that at yeah. that time and, and carried into the real true sanctuary that, that's in, in heaven. Yeah. And so this happened day after day all year long. But once a year, a very, very special day, a very special time, God had appointed uh, each time, once once a year, uh, that that the sins that were carried into the sanctuary all year long would be cleansed because you could even picture the sanctuary uh, being unclean. And in fact, there's a scripture that I'd like to share about that. in Leviticus chapter 16. Uh, it says, so he 
16, verse 16, so he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins, so he should do uh, for the tabernacle meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Now this was called a day of atonement. A day of, at one. Make getting right with God is what it was all, all about. And, and this was in also a time of judgment. Okay, it was a very solemn day. Uh, in fact, uh, 10 days before this event would happen, they would, they would blow these silver trumpets and let everyone know that this was about to happen. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, this, and it was a time of heart searching. It was, it was a day of time of judgment. It was a time of, of getting right with God. It was a, a time to put away all, all uh, sin in your life. Uh, all unconfessed sin needed to be brought to God at, the, at that time. Yeah, and so, so, so the reason why this happened was God hates sin. Am I right? Yes. But he loves the sinner. So God was in a predicament. How can he love the sinner attached to sin? So he had to come up with a system where he could separate the two because his hatred for sin is as intense as his love for the sinner is. Mm -hmm. So he had to separate the two. So that's why the substitutionary system came in. God said, I can love the sinner, but I can hate the sin at the same time. Yes. And so that's why this beautiful picture is painted in the sanctuary for us where God says, I am going to separate the sin. And, and as pastors has been going through here, we see how God takes the sin from the sinner. It goes to the substitute. It pays the wages of, of sin, am I right? Which is death. Mm -hmm. From that point on, I am free and clear. But now the priest had a, a part to play, removing the sin. And you've got verses in the Bible like Psalms 103.12 that says God will move remove the sin as far as the east is from the west That's from right. us. Amen. And he will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. But that happens at some point in the future because our sins are just in the sanctuary right now. Yeah. And we're going to the Day of Atonement now to show how God does that final separation so, for us. Yeah. The, the reason, I'm, and I'm, I'm wanting to paint this picture, or we're wanting to paint this yeah. picture here, is we know, want you to know that God had it planned that there was going to be a time on, on his, in His clock, eternal time sure. clock, that, that there was going to be put uh, sin away, that, there, that he was going to cleanse the sanctuary in heaven. Uh, and in fact, in Daniel 8, 14, it says, it, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary should be cleansed. It's talking about the sanctuary in heaven. God has pointed a day when he will put away sin forever. Now, in this first angel message that, that we're talking about here tells us that we're living in that judgment time right now. That time. It's time for us all to get right with God. A time of heart searching and repentance. So, now, now we're ready to get into the second message. <laughs> the second so, angel message. So, here. so Pastor, uh, just, to, just to short this up quickly here. This whole thing about this 10 days before the Day of Atonement, a time of heart searching where people made right with each one another. This is just not an Old Testament concept. Yeah. Because Jesus comes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 24, and he says... Uh, leave your gift before the altar. If you got something wrong with your brother, go fix with him first. Then That's right. come offer your gift. Yeah. So the it's not just what Jesus is doing; it's what He's doing in us, so That's we right. can be right with each other. Down Absolutely. Here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So the second angel message. Tim, would you read the Revelation fourteen verse eight? And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Okay, there it is. Guys, what does Babylon mean? <laughs> we know it's the opposing city to Jerusalem. We know that, yeah. right? There are two cities, in, and that's kind of the, the title of our study tonight. Mm -hmm. It's the two cities. We have the king of Jerusalem and then we have the king of Babylon. Yep. And in Isaiah 14 that we looked at last week, Isaiah 14 tells us that the king of Babylon is, is equated to Lucifer. Mm -hmm. So we know who the king of Babylon is. The dragon. Is. The dragon yeah. is the king of Babylon. Who's the king of Jerusalem? 
the white horse rider, Jesus, am I right? And when you look at the attitudes of the two, the one says, I want to be bigger than what I am. And Jesus comes in Philippians chapter 2, and he comes as a servant. Yeah. That is the attitude of Jerusalem. Like John the Baptist said, I must <clears throat> decrease. Your second he must lesson increase. on following the Lamb wherever right. he goes. That's right. Yeah. Servant. 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 Serving. Servant. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. <clears throat> Anything else? Yeah. So, so Babylon comes from old Babel, am I right? That's yeah. where Babel if you started go back, back if, in Genesis. If you go back to, what is it, Genesis chapter 11? 11, yeah, yeah, with Nimrod. Yeah, Nimrod. He was the founder. Descendant of Noah. That's right. Yeah. He, was, he, he, he wanted to build the city. When God said disperse, they said, no, we're going to congregate in one place. Yeah. And we're going to build a tower so tall that God can't flood us out. This time, we'll just run into the tower. So when we look at Babylon, if we look at the attitude of Babylon, Babylon sets up a system of self-worship. Yes. Trusting. That's the problem. Yeah. Trusting in your own merits, trusting in something other than Jesus. It could be anything else. Absolutely. There's two things that jump out here. Yeah. Uh, in in the as we go back, first first hear the word Babel, Babylon in in Genesis chapter eleven verse one. Uh, they they these people these people doubted God's word. They didn't trust Him. Remember, God right. they had a flood. Had the flood, and God says, "I'm not gonna. There's not gonna have another flood. Gave the rainbow. Promise right. you, no more flood." Okay. Another right. thing they did is it, they they were in defiance of God's will. God, what was God's after the flood? He told Noah and his family to do what? Be fruitful, Be fruitful multiply, fruitful, multiply, spread out, fill the across, earth, fill the earth, spread right. out across the earth. Yeah. And I want to read a scripture here that that's going to tell us a lot about Babylon. In in Genesis chapter eleven, verse four, it says. And they said, "Go to and let us build." It. This is this is this is in the, the 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 first the first even word about Babylon. Let's go and build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. What were they do? Why were they doing that? They they thought there was going to be another flood. They were going to right. save their self. Okay, right. righteous uh, by their works. That's right. And let us make us a name, lest we lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. God had told them to to uh, scatter the whole earth and be right. fruitful. They said, right. No, we're gonna we're gonna build a place right here because we don't want to scatter. So they were in defiance of God's word here. So that's 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 two I would say very important things that jump out uh, there. And, and and then we know that that the that um. What happened? God, until then, they only had one language. And, but what, what did God do? He, confused their, he confused their language. So Babel, if you, if you, if you look at the Hebrew word uh, connected to that, it's, it's Bala, it's, it means to confuse. And yeah. so, uh, and then the very next thing we see is the actual literal city, kingdom of Babylon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Babylon. Did y'all see that pop up in the news this week uh, over in Ur, where Abraham's from? Mm-hmm. There is, there is a, they have a word, I think it was ziggurat, but it's, it's like, it's the base of the Tower of Babel. Uh-huh. Did you have, you didn't have oh, to say, no. see that? Uh-huh. I mean, it's really cool. This is, this has been unearthed in recent years, but some other political something made it possible that we got cameras on it this week. Huh. And I just thought it was so yeah. cool because here we are trying to talk about it and, and it's right there. Right out of the province of Babylon. Yeah, yeah. If you look, yeah. if you overlay the map, Ur of the Chaldees is yeah. just to the north of the actual city of, of Babylon. Babylon. Yeah. Amazing. And that's where that yeah. where that yeah. tower that's was. Need that so yeah, praise God. When you when you break down the word Babel, <clears throat> yeah. Bab means gate, and L means God. So this could be another gate to God. Yeah. What God? Not the yeah. true God, am I right? Mm-hmm. This is the false God. That's right. The so yeah. they so they proclaimed a different way to God, yeah, instead of the true way, which is through only through Jesus. Yeah. yeah. So we're getting a picture here. What Babylon? What What is Babylon here? That, that God's warning here. And one another thing jumps out here when we studied in Daniel. In, in Daniel, when we studied Daniel uh, back in in Daniel three. Remember when we studied Daniel three? What did Nebuchadnezzar do? He built he built a large image. Daniel That's chapter right. three, three was about what? It was worship. about worship, worship or counterfeit worship. worship. And 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 he built a large 
golden image, 90 foot tall, and put it in the plain of Dura, and he and he and 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 he asked everybody, commanded everybody to worship. Um, Daniel chapter three, verse 10 through 12. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whosoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your guards or worship the gold image which you have set up. So, so, so in the Bible, Babylon is a very vivid symbol of religious confusion and false worship. That's right. So we can get a clue of why spiritual Babylon is going to fall, right? If we look at why ancient Babylon fell. Mm -hmm. So we see in Daniel 4 and Daniel 5, it was Nebuchadnezzar's arrogance that caused him to be an animal for seven years. Am I right? Yeah. He said, did I not build this great Babylon? Self-sufficiency. You already talked about defiance against God with, with uh, Belshazzar, with the handwriting on the wall. Uh, irreverence for God. They had no fear of God. Mm -hmm. They didn't give God glory. Mm -hmm. And they didn't worship the Creator. Yep. So we can expect the same things that caused ancient Babylon to fall to be the reasons for spiritual Babylon to fall. Good as point. Well. Yeah. Tim, we have not let you talk. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, um, I'm just thinking, thinking in terms of that, that Tower of Babel, this is the beginning of it. And that was their attempt to save themselves. It's just simple. Yeah. You've got the system of the sacrifices coming right off the ark. Mm -hmm. Salvation by faith through, through the sacrifice, a representation of what would be the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Salvation by faith versus I'm going to save myself. And, and every uh, the thread that runs through all heathen religions is that man can save himself. Mm -hmm. Th this is ultimately what we're up against in trying to explain the three angels' messages. Christ alone is our, is our creed. It's He is our salvation. Um, and I can't help but think about Elijah. And I'm not going to be able to get into that tonight. <laughs> oh, how I wish I could. But Elijah comes up and for three and a half years, there's this great famine. A famine for the word of God. And he calls all the people to Mount Carmel. And this was the Mount of Megiddo. Armageddon. There's so many parallels here. In our day, we have seen the great famine where the the sea beast and, and the dragon ruled for 1260 years, the great famine. And now we've come out on the other side and we're in the time of God's judgment. And we're, we're all battling the desire to save ourselves. And, you know, each one of us, we've talked about how we need to be going to Christ every day. Well, each one of us has a devotional life. A hundred percent, each one of us has a devotional life. A lot of people get up and they read the sports page and they mm -hmm. can't hardly put it down and they wonder where the time went and you never hear them saying anything like, oh, this is boring and I can't, I can't keep my thoughts on it. I can't concentrate <laughs> when I'm reading it. No, yeah. <laughs> the time just flies when they're reading the sports page. That's right. I've been there, people. <laughs> the, then there's those that wake up and uh, they're worshiping themselves by what, how they're you know, doing their hair and what clothes they put on. I mean, it, it, there are so many, <laughs> so many ways that we can be in Babylon, yes. even though we're sitting here saying, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm a Christian. Yeah. But are you? Salvation by faith alone, 
Or, or do, you have a, do you have a Babylonian religion where it's salvation by faith and works? There, or, or I'm trying to save myself. Because anybody who wakes up and doesn't commit themselves to God first thing in the morning is saying by default, I don't need you. I yeah. can do this myself. Yeah. That's Babylonian religion. Yes. Uh, final thought. Elijah calls them all to Megiddo, Mount Carmel. And his question is the three angels' messages. How long halt ye between two opinions? You're going to worship God or you're going to worship Baal or, or yourself? It's, just, it's, the, it's the three angels' messages. Oh, <laughs> I just got the, you better stop message. No, 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 no. Finish, finish, your, finish, your, thought. finish your thought. Finish your thought. Yeah. But I mean, that's true. Um, Tim, you're absolutely right. I mean, that we have come to the point where we have to say, I'm all yours. Because if, if we're not all his, we're not his at all. If the Lord is God, serve him. That's right. Yeah. If self is God, serve, him. serve yourself. Yeah. You've got a choice tonight. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, given that, where did time go tonight? It went by so quick, and I, um, I, I wish to have. We covered a lot Sorry. of great, we're, but you know what? We, we're going we're gonna to pick up here next week, but what I want to do, I want to give you a wrap-up. I think that's important. What's your, what's your final thoughts? One thing that, um, what's your final thoughts? Um, Babylon pedals self-made religion mm -hmm. that's what it does so we read the bible and often we want to treat god like the state trooper on the interstate okay how far can we go over the speed limit without getting a ticket you've been talking to cindy mm -hmm. no but I, what i'm <laughs> what i'm saying is <laughs> what i'm saying is god doesn't work that way mm -hmm. there's no leeway Jesus had to live a perfect life, which he's willing to credit to my account if I will surrender to him. Yeah. And what we have today in many of our churches is Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy in chapter uh, 2 Timothy 4, uh, um, 4 verse 3, 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 and 4 says, at the end of time will come a time when people will not endure sound doctrine, but they will after their own lust, they'll heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. So all they wanted to hear from the pulpit is stuff that's not going to make them want to repent. Okay? And in many of our Christian churches, we have that happening. Mm -hmm. People are not called to repentance. And basically what we're doing is we're creating a straw God, the one that fits into our bag. Yeah. So it's not I'm following the lamb. The lamb needs to come along for the right with yes. me. Yes. I'm in charge. He's not in charge. Yeah. And we have to be careful here that we don't step into this trap that the devil has made for us. Yeah. We have to say, Lord, help me to die to self and put you as king on the throne of my Amen. heart. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tim? Okay, I get to make this one quick. Babylon's problem is fornication. Mm -hmm. This emerging of salvation in Christ alone with salvation by works. And there's a there's an immutable truth that we need to recognize tonight that man's plot power, let me say that again, man's power plus God's power equals no power. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Did you hear that? Mm hmm. That's still abiding by the fornication principle. This, all the power comes from God. All good gifts come down from the Father of lights. He is the one who gives us repentance. He gives us the ability to forgive. Mm -hmm. He gives us salvation. He gives us faith. And it's by that faith of the Son of God that we've got to live by. When we have that faith, getting up in the morning and putting Jesus first, allowing him to to who's the one who's standing at the door knocking allowing him to come in this is where our power comes from mm -hmm. 
that he's the one that can extricate the sin from our hearts. Mm -hmm. He's the one that can give us the victory over mm -hmm. sin. Every time we think to try to do it on our own, we're going to end up in failure. That's right. <clears throat> okay. Very good, guys. All right. We've heard, we, this has been a good study. Uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, the Bible is very clear that there is a, the devil is deceiving people into to a, what we would call a false uh, relationship, false worship, uh, you, that people think that, uh, that they can just have this knowledge, a head knowledge maybe uh, of God, or they can rely on what other people tell them about God. And God has said, no, I want you to go deeper. I want you to trust me. I want you to live your life by thus saith the Lord. In these last days, we have got to, to trust the word of God above everything else, above what everybody's telling you, what everybody else is doing. Trust God with all your heart. Follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes. And mm -hmm. we're going to dig a lot more into this next week. Please uh, please uh, tell your friends about this. We're digging into the three angel message. We just got started on the second angel. We'll, we'll, we'll pick up here in the second angel here next week when we get started. But, but right now, we would like to pray. We don't have any time for prayer, huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. oh. We have no, no okay, okay, all right. Well, praise the Lord. Well, <laughs> we we know that uh, we need to pray that the Holy Spirit would 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 impress each one of us to dig deeper into the Word of God um, here and and just study study the Word of God, get into the Word of God and allow Him to lead and guide us to all truth. So, all right, guys. Well, let's just have a let's have some prayer at the end if you have prayer may, they need to be short prayers but let's all of us okay. have a prayer and we'll okay. wind this up tonight heavenly father your word is a never-ending source of life for us you've basically thrown us a lifeline we're caught in the storms of life and if if we don't grab a hold of the lifeline we're not going to make it lord Jesus, you said you are the word and you became flesh and dwelt among us. So if we want to not get to know you, we have to be in your word. The only word we have is the one covered with the two, two black uh, covers. We have to go there to get to know you. So I pray, Lord, that we will all make a resolution this evening that we will search you for you with all our hearts because you've promised if we do that, that you'll be, fine, you'll be found by us. Thank you for your guiding spirit. Thank you for what you've done for us and what you still want to do in us in preparation for your soon return, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I'm thankful tonight that anyone who comes unto you, you will in no wise cast out. I'm thankful that you have graven us on the palm of your hands. I am thankful that you know that we are but dust and that your compassions fail not and your mercies are fresh every morning. I pray for everyone who's, who's been watching and listening that they would have the courage to connect with you tonight and tomorrow morning and for the rest of their lives. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, we come to you because we want to stay close to you. We want, we want to follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes, Lord. So we pray for your Holy Spirit to continue to lead and guide us to all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, friends. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, just know the best is yet to come because Jesus is coming soon. Bye-bye.